Is Reagan here? Yeah. I'd like to call the House Health Committee to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Representatives Boyd, Carringer, Clemens, Faison, Farmer, Gillespie, Hakeem, Hawk, Haynes, Hemmer, Hicks of Hawkins, Hicks of Washington, Jernigan, Kumar, Martin, Mitchell, Rudder, Cheryl, Travis, Vaughn, Whitson, Williams, Vice Chairman Leatherwood, Chairman Terry. Mr. Chair. Chairman, you have a quorum. All right, thank you. And before we get started here, um, the members have personal orders. Uh, Chairman uh, Williams first. Thank you, uh, Chairman Terry. I wanted to um, welcome and honor a good friend of mine who has decided to return uh, to this Hallowood Assembly. He's sitting to my right. Um, he looks like he just returned from Afghanistan because he forgot to train, trim his beard when he got here. He uh, served under Governor Haslam's administration, was legislative director for a long time. We got many fisticuffs together, but he has become one of my great friends. As a matter of fact, so much so, he and his wife, Jessica, asked me to be their, the godfather of their son, Wright. And so he now serves as the CEO of Celebration in Shelbyville. And I hope you'd make him welcome. His name is Warren Wells. Thank you for coming. Yeah, Warren. how there? Yeah. I'm glad to have you. Uh, uh, Representative Travis, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. And I also have a constituent here from Bledsoe County, Amy Miller. Would you say hello? <laughs> uh, thank you all for being here. Um, we do have 10 items. Oh, you have another one? Uh, Chairman Williams. Rarely do I have more than one friend in the room. But uh, I do want to... Well, two, two friends. Thank you, Chairman. I actually see my old assistant has come in the room. She's decided to leave the dark side, head over to the lobby. So Jessica Myers is here today. Welcome her. It's first time here today. So uh, welcome you. her as well. Thank you. All righty. That brings us to our calendar of the day. Um, item number one, House Bill 1380. Chairman Reagan, you have a motion and a second. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And you have an amendment, is that I correct? I have uh, amendment 6518, sir. Okay, you have a motion second on the amendment. If there's no objection, let's go ahead and get the, uh, the amendment on so we can get this uh, in order. All those in favor of amendment 6518, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. We are back on the bill as amended. You are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, I bring before you House Bill 1380, which is called the Mature Minor Clarification Act. Its purpose is to get some clarity around a judicial doctrine that has been, in my personal opinion, misapplied. Uh, but what this bill does is ensure that parents have the right to make medical decisions for their children. The amendment that you just put on there clarifies the definition of vaccines, takes out a registry requirement that the Department of Health would have to make rules regarding, uh, pardon me, they have to, they have to anyway. Uh, I will point out to you that that doctrine this bill is trying and seeking to clarify violates the 1986 Childhood Vaccine Injury Act, which requires parents to be given vaccine information prior to the administration of a vaccine. Uh, minors are restricted in a number of ways all the time. 13-year-olds can't drive a car, 15-year-olds can't join the military, 17-year-olds can't smoke or get a tattoo. Quite obviously, the law recognizes that at various ages, judgment is not sound enough to understand long-term consequences and decisions. Even movies have ratings that restrict age uh, of, of individuals attending them. Children, especially teenagers, love to push boundaries. Children should be part of their families and should be under the care, regardless of their age, of their parents because their parents are responsible for those children. And I'll close with that emphasis. Parents, pardon me, children belong to their families, not the state. With that, I stand ready to answer questions. I ask for a positive recommendation, and there are some people to testify if you have questions. All right. Do we have any members that would like to uh, ask questions before we go out of session? 
All right, uh, Representative Keem, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Reagan, I, I, I guess I'm hearing, uh, is that an inference that children are deciding on their own to get a vaccine? Are, are schools or someone providing them with a vaccine without parental support? You're right, Mr. Straightforward answer to your question is yes, in both cases. Our own DCS has been known to do that. When they take a child into custody, they sometimes go get them uh, vaccinations, even though they know when they do it, it's going to be a temporary situation. They go get those childs vaccinated without, or those children vaccinated without their per parents' permission. And frankly, that's not the way our law is set up, nor should it be. Mm -hmm. You recognize? Thank you. Uh, I guess with, I'm asking a question. With DCS, a lot of times they're put into a, I guess, a family situation or in a group situation. And should, I guess, for their protection or the protection of the family or group they're with, um, with everything that we have going around as far as uh, concerns with contagiousness. You recognize? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Straightforward answer to your question. There is a path for them to be able to do that. They can go to a judge and get permission. However, without that, they don't have the legal authority to do that. Children belong to their families, not the state, not to DCS. Admittedly, DCS is in bad situations sometimes with getting children in, but that does not give them the authority to make those decisions without judicial input or parental input. One last question. Yeah, you're great. You're great. Okay. Uh, does that have the potential of putting that child or other children who are around that child in jeopardy because they're not vaccinated? You're right, Constance. You realize that I earn my living as a statistician, don't you? Okay. So the question is, yes, there's always jeopardy, even if they are vaccinated. It's a question of how many zeros after that decimal place you're talking about. And I would point out to you that we have a number of situations where parents object on religious basis or children sometimes are allergic to components of vaccine. So there is risk there, yes, because they don't get vaccinated for those reasons. And I submit to you that risk is unavoidable. The situation we're talking about here is making sure that we as a body, lawmakers, do not create laws that are overriding long established principles, parental rights, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Thank you. Any further questions before we go out of session? Okay, seeing none, uh, without objection, we'll go out of session. Uh, is there a Rolf Hazelhurst? Okay, and just for the record, uh, make sure your mic is on. Tell us uh, your name and uh, who you're with, and then you will have three minutes. Okay, is it on now? <laughs> Uh, thank you. My name is Rolf Hazelhurst. I'm from Jackson, Tennessee. I'm the senior staff attorney for Children's Health Defense. I was previously an assistant district attorney general for the state of Tennessee. Unfortunately, 20 years ago, my son suffered severe and permanent brain damage as the result of a vaccine injury. I'm asking you to vote yes for the Mature Minor Clarification Act because it is necessary to protect children, to protect the parents, and to protect healthcare providers um, from the, uh, the legal consequences of very bad legal advice that was given by the Tennessee Department of Health uh, two years ago. As you may recall, two years ago, the Department of Health was pushing the COVID-19 vaccine. In the process, the Department of Health uh, gave, an, during the joint GovOps committee meeting, gave dangerously oversimplistic and highly misleading advice regarding the mature minor doctrine and how it applies to vaccines in Tennessee. The legal opinion that the Department of Health was pushing and widely publicized, it's not only wrong, dangerous, but it also conflicts with longstanding federal law. So unfortunately, Tennessee is leading the way in the push to defy federal law and allow children to be vaccinated without parental consent. I'll give you just one example running parallel in time. 
The District of Columbia passed a law, the Mature Minor Consent Act, which allowed children 11 years old and older to be vaccinated without parental consent. I, as the senior staff attorney for Children's Health Defense, filed a federal lawsuit. We challenged that law as unconstitutional and that it violates the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act and therefore the supremacy clause of the U.S. Constitution. To make a long story short, the federal judge agreed with us and uh, granted a preliminary injunction and the District of Columbia was forced to withdraw uh, that, uh, that law. The reason I tell you that story is because during the federal lawsuit, the District of Columbia was relying upon the Tennessee Department of Health's incorrect legal opinion about the mature minor doctrine. Uh, anyway, the, the federal judge disagreed with the Tennessee Department of Health and the District of Columbia ruled in favor of the parents. The bottom line is Dr. Fiscus is gone, but the the legal damage that was caused by that advice needs to be fixed. And the best way to fix it to protect the parents, the children, and the health care providers is to pass this Clarification Act. What it basically does is clarify the law. Um, it's legally complex. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. I'll just say one last thing to address the gentleman's question about the dangers. There are, there are also, there, it is dangerous to vaccinate a child without the parent's knowledge and consent, because if the child gets vaccinated, has an adverse reaction, it, the parents won't know that the child is having a reaction to get proper medical care. Thank you very much. Thank you. And while we're out of session with Mr. Hazelhurst here, do we have any questions for him? Okay. Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Uh, appreciate you very it very much. much. All right. uh, next on our list is Denise Sibley. And again, for the record, uh, who you are, who you're with, and uh, make sure that mic's on. Thank you. I'm Dr. Denise Sibley from Johnson City, Tennessee. I represent myself uh, and a physician, and just physicians in general. Um, I come here in support of clarification of this uh, mature minor doctrine. As a physician and a parent, I support parental rights to make vaccination decisions for their minor children as they are legally and financially responsible for their children. Minor children and teenagers are often not aware of their medical history or history of adverse ev events to medications or previous interventions. Therefore, they're not able to fully give informed consent. Whether there are contraindications, that is, they shouldn't be given to a procedure or to a vaccination. No medication, medical procedure, or vaccination is 100% safe for 100% of the individuals. In fact, from the CDC website, I quote, no vaccine is actually 100% safe or effective for everyone because each person body each person's body reacts differently to vaccines differently, in quotes. Um, for instance, in the COVID vaccination through the 2021 VAERS data, 3% of children had an adverse reaction. If the parents are unaware of the vaccination, they would be in, in the dark about an adverse reaction in their child, and they would not perhaps recognize it. The medical care would be suboptimal as me as a physician seeing that person I, they may not be able to respond appropriately knowing what was happening. Also, these minors are not able to drive themselves to a facility for medical care. And in our area, which is a three-state, 21-county health system, our urgent care facility will not allow children under 18 to be seen without parental written consent. Um, so this, this mature minor... Um, doctrine needs clarified to allow appropriate care for children in the setting of their parents having rights um, and financial and uh, responsibility for them, uh, medical responsibility. Um, uh, this was a national, a national Childhood Vaccine Injury Act was passed and the compensation program was set up in 1986 for injury, so we know that it does occur. And as of January, 2023, 
9,500 people have been paid in excess of $4.5 billion since the program's 1988 inception. Thank you, Chairman Terry. All right, thank you. Do we have any questions? All right. um, you are recognized. Uh, thank you, Chairman Terry. Uh, yes, Doctor. Have you ever treated anyone with smallpox? No, sir. Have you ever treated anyone with polio? No, sir. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions for the witness? Okay. Um, thank you for your testimony. I appreciate it. Thank and, you, Chairman. All right. Well, uh, any further comments while well, we are out of session? Okay. Seeing none, uh, we will go back into session. Uh, Chairman Reagan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen of the committee, let me emphasize that last statement that I closed with. Children belong to their families, not the state. The parents have responsibility for their children. It should be, and until recently always was, the responsibility of the parent to give their consent for any medical procedure, including vaccinations. I leave you with that thought. Children belong to their families, and I ask for a positive vote. Thank you, oh, Mr. Thank Chair. You. Uh, Representative Keene, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I might be confusing myself, but I, I get the, an implication that children are being vaccinated, I'm going to say at school, without parental approval, and that when there's an adverse reaction, parents don't know anything about it. I, I, I'm trying to understand, are, are we saying that government is vaccinating the children without parents having any knowledge of what they're doing? You recognize? The straightforward answer to your question is yes, that's true in some cases. In other cases, they're being vaccinated because a minor thinks themselves smart enough and mature enough to go ask for a vaccination on their own, and it's not necessarily from the government. The idea of being straightforward uh, is we restrict them, as I noted. Minors below the age of 16 can't drive, below the age of 17 can't enlist, et cetera, et cetera. PG-13, our, our restrictions in movies. There are all kinds of restrictions that are based on a child's age, and there should be, and there is, in fact, a requirement for parental consent in a lot of those cases. This bill does nothing more than say the parents have the right to make the decision for their children's health care. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, Representative Mitchell. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, sponsor, in this longstanding uh, legal ruling of the rule of sevens, isn't that what we're affecting here today? You recognize? Yes, sir. We're saying that that decision, which was imposed by a judge in a court case, and by the way, I will point, I have the court case in front of me. If you want, we can go through it. How long ago was that? Excuse me, I, Mr. Chair, if you mind, I'll, I'll dig that. Or I could ask Mr. Hazelhorst. Um, Uh, no, we, uh, I'm sorry, which date were you? Sorry. No. Do you have the date? I have the date of the Vaccine Injury Act, 1986. The court decision uh, was Cardwell versus Bechtel, and uh, I don't have the date of that right here. Uh, Representative Mitchell, is it the exact date pertinent it's, to your it's, question? It's longstanding precedent is what I was getting at. Uh, so you... You have a, as I demonstrated earlier with one of your witnesses, the reasons we have certain diseases non-existent in our society anymore is because of immunization. And if we go down this path that where we, you know, I've sat here on this health committee this year and heard us many times say parents didn't have the right to treat their children uh, for many things this year. and But now it's all about the parents. Well, if a child has the good sense 
to make certain they're going to go get a meningitis vaccine or they're going to go get a measles or a mumps vaccine, or they may be seeing millions of people dying around the world from a, a pandemic and they got good sense to go get a vaccine and they're 14 years of age or older because that's what the rule of sevens more or less states. I don't see how that's bad for our society by holding down, holding down diseases that would not only affect them and their family, but who they spread it to in society, you know? So could you, could you please tell me how, how, society benefits from your from your legislation today you recognize i'd be glad to i'll just point out to you that the 14 year old that you cited is not allowed to go to a a movie that's r-rated they can't drive they can't enlist in the military they can't get married under the age of 18 they can't get tattoos so if we are concerned about their good sense and they have the good sense why don't we open it up to all of them i, I submit to you sir that the Good sense that you're talking about is something that they don't have the judgment or the experience to be able to exercise at that age. You recognize? Yes, sir. Uh, can that 14 year old die from meningitis? Can that 14 year old die from COVID? Can that 14 year old get HPV? That 14 year old. I'm oh, sorry, Mr. You recognize? That 14 year old can be killed by a drunk driver or a school shooter or, or yeah, exactly any number right. of other things. Yeah, I'm glad so you said is, that. Excuse me. You recognize. All right, thank Chairman. you. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. That 14 year old has a lot of risk in a lot of different ways. The very premise that you put forward is that their parents are incapable of making that judgment for them. They have to make it on their own. And I submit to you that that is incorrect, sir. Right, you recognize. You stated yourself that DCS was doing it. Uh, I think you, those folks that, some of the children in DCS, we've deemed them unable to care for the children, so we've taken them out of the homes. So your premise is moot in that point. Uh, but, I mean, I just don't see that it's our role to to stop someone who medical science has proven, you know, we heard 9,000 people have been injured. How many hundreds of millions of people have been vaccinated and only 9,000 injuries. Just think about that. Now, you said you're a statistician. Give me those stats. You recognize? Sir, your stats are incomplete. N nonetheless, I'll point out to you quite honestly that vaccination is not what I'm saying is wrong here. What I'm saying is wrong is that children should be part of their families and their parents who are responsible for them should be making the decision. Certainly, if they want to get them the vaccines as parents, mighty fine. But it's their decision. It's not DCS's. It's not their own. The parents are in charge, both physically and otherwise, under our legal system, of their children. You recognize? As long as we were consistent across the board with that last statement, I'd agree with you. But we're not consistent. And you know, I want you can look back at your own votes and see if you were consistent. But I'm just saying, if, if someone is willing to get back to your stats, that's a pretty good batting average, I would say, of 9,000 out of, you know, probably 700 million vaccines. That's a pretty good batting average. You, you'd make a lot of money in Major League Baseball with that batting average. But if someone is prohibiting a child from getting a vaccine and that child is of the age that the court has ruled that they are capable of making that decision, why would you stop a child from protecting themselves from a serious disease that could kill them? You recognize I would point out to you that you're using one court case. You've heard one cited already, and there are several others that have said that the court case that you're citing have been overruled. So when you cite a court case, let's talk about all of them. That one was older. The newer ones have said no, quite straightforwardly. While I respect your opinion, sir, I think it's an error. Children belong to their families. 
Chairman Kumar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Sponsor. I sincerely hope that we can change the conversation that vaccines are a great scientific gift, a gift from God, and they save lives. At the same time, parental authority is also God's dictum to us, honor thy father and mother. So really, I don't want to frame this in an anti-vaccine bill. I think it is good sense of the parenting that should be conveyed to the children, and we should be all for that. At the same time, we should realize that vaccines are really a very effective way of combating disease. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Thank you. Do we have any further questions for the sponsor? Okay. Seeing none, uh, we will be voting on House Bill 1380 as amended. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Ayes have it. Bill goes on to government operations. Thank you, sir. If you wish to be recorded as a no, please tell the clerk. Right. That brings us... Uh, Chairman Faison. Can I just go out of order just for a minute? I, I just want to y'all to welcome the new ex officio for Representative Ryan Williams. While he's gone, this is my son Tucker, and he's joined us today. He will not be voting though. He's an ex officio member. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Right, that brings us to item number two, House Bill 1511 by Representative Wright. You have motion and a second. You are recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee. Uh, let me first say I appreciate the uh, health subcommittee passing this bill out the other day, and there were um, questions and uh, concerns about the way the 16-page bill read, and there is amendment traveling now that I'd like to have placed, which makes the bill. There are, there are two amendments. Uh, which amendment are we looking to adopt? Seven one. Two seven. Okay, and that one's a little bit different than what we had in subcommittee. Uh, you want us to put that on and describe it? Yes. Then describe. Okay. Without objection, um, we're going to vote on amendment seven one two seven. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Ayes have it. We're back on the bills amended. You are recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, the one of the concerns the other day was about the mixing and matching of different facilities of different titles. The four-page uh, amendment that is here before us today talks only of the four and under headcount of uh, residents in these homes in uh, rather common settings. Um, I would stand for questions uh, if anyone would like to uh, discuss this, but ultimately, because time has run out on this bill, I will... Uh, be asking to take the bill off notice because there are things that we have to work on about who's going to do the licensing. Okay. All right. If there is no further objection, uh, thank you for your presentation. Looking forward to, to working with you on this. So without objection, uh, House Bill 1511 has been taken off notice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee. All right. That brings us to Item number three, House Bill 647. Chairman Baum, you have a motion and a second. Thank you, Chairman Terry, and I believe there's an amendment 7172. Okay. Yes, 7172, that is the amendment. That is correct. Uh, you have a motion and a second. Uh, Without objection, let's go ahead and put that on the bill. Uh, all those in favor of 7172, say aye. aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Uh, we're back on the bill as amended. You're recognized. Thank you, Chairman Terry. It turns out Tennessee code specifies how much patients can be charged for their medical records. Currently in code, patients can be charged $20 for the first five pages and 50 cents for every page thereafter. So as an example, if a patient had 12,000 pages of medical records, they could be charged $6,000. That's just one example, and I've shown you the invoice, some of you, the invoice for that example. This is a bill that's designed to update our code for technology. Here's why. A lot of medical records now come in the form of electronic documents, they're PDFs, and they can be emailed. 
No longer do these documents have to be Xeroxed and sent through the postal mail. This bill updates the charges that a patient uh, can receive, and I think the primary uh, update is that they would be capped at $90. This bill is the result of an agreement between the Tennessee Medical Association, Tennessee Bar Association, Tennessee Trial Lawyers Association, and SIOX, which is one of, or is actually the largest third-party medical records provider. And I should also point out that this bill only updates these fees with the $90 cap for electronic medical records. It doesn't affect paper medical records. It doesn't affect hospitals and it doesn't affect the parts of the statutes that deal with workers' compensation. I'm happy to answer any questions you have on this. Uh, Representative King. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if it's appropriate, could you tell me, in an instance where today persons re get their medical records on paper, are they informed uh, up front as to the cost is that one of those surprise bills kind of things? You many recognize? many patients uh, receive their medical records through a third party. They might have an attorney, mm -hmm. and I would assume the attorney knows what the charges are in statutes, whether they relay those costs to the patients or not. I don't know. There are other cases where the patients attempt to get these records on their own, uh, but I can't tell you whether the patients are aware of these charges in statute or not. I do have a stack of sample invoices that patients actually have received. And I know once they receive those invoices, they know what the charges are. And in many cases, it amounts to thousands of dollars. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any further questions? Well, before we uh, do that, I just, uh, there is a clerical error in the amendment. I just want to get on the record from you. We were trying to get, it was going to be an untimely filed amendment, but the Senate is actually going to fix something. So... <laughs> <laughs> So uh, your plan is to conform when that clerical error gets uh, and conform to that. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. Thank you. All right. Without objection, we will be uh, voting on uh, Bill uh, 647. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Bill goes on to count and rules. Thank you all. Thank you. All right. That brings us to item number four, House Bill 942. Uh, Representative Alexander, you are recognized. You have a motion and a second. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Committee. And um, is there a, there's an amendment? Yes. Okay, amendment. Uh, 5304. Code 5304. Can I get a motion? You have a motion and a second. Okay, if there's that rewrites the bill, and if there's no objections, go ahead and get that on the bill. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Uh, we are back on the bills amended. You are recognized. Thank you. This bill is brought jointly by the Tennessee Dental Association and the Ten Tennessee Dental Hygienist Association. It is a result of a group effort led by the Council on State Government and including the ADA, the ADHA, and the U.S. Department of Defense and others. As amended, the bill would include Tennessee as an original member of the Interstate Licensure Compact for Dentist and Dental Hygienist, which is similar to the existing compacts for psychology, nursing, physical therapy, in which Tennessee is a participant. Tennessee has a shortage of dentists and especially hygienists at the present, and joining the compact will have a positive impact by erasing or easing, excuse me, the barrier to cross-state practice, cross-state lines, basically, practice to be able to practice in the membering states. Each compact state must have substantially the same licensure requirements. The scope of a practice would remain under the control of the state in which the oral health services are provided. Individuals and dentists applying for accreditation under the compact would have to apply for the compact privilege and provide license verification. A participating state has authority to impose an adverse action against a provider licensed by that state, but a remote state may take action to revoke or remove a license privilege in the remote state. That is the sum of my bill. All right. Any questions for the bill? Not sponsor. And being that we are the first, and I asked you this in subcommittee, 
uh, in the event that some other state uh, uh, has something that builds a better mousetrap to this, it's the intent to uh, improve this as it goes along. Is that correct? That is correct. Right, we will awesome. come back and amend it. All right. Thank you. Uh, any further questions? Seeing none, we'll be voting on House Bill 942 as amended. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Bill goes on to government operations. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Committee. Thank you. That brings us to item number five, House Bill 827. Uh, Representative Sparks, you are recognized. Yep. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, members. Uh, yeah. Members, House Bill... Need a motion? Okay, you have a motion second. Right. Thank you. Uh, House Bill 8, 827, legislation that is needed to help emergency departments, mental health crisis teams, and families... Um, be more efficient to help identify available psychiatric beds across the state, a process that, that currently takes several days or longer as patients wait in an emergency department to get a bed, otherwise known as ED boarding. Emergency rooms are already overburdened as we, overburdened, as we all know, and generally not equipped to manage uh, folks in a mental health crisis for extended periods of time. Knowing exactly where all the open psychiatric beds are in the state would help greatly to help improve providers link patients to the right kind of inpatient care as quickly as possible, which will help prevent unnecessary um, room, uh, emergency room uh, boarding. The bill also helps leverage the Department of Health existing healthcare resource tracking system known as the HERT system, which is already used by Tennessee psychiatric hospitals to list their bed availability. Um, I'm open for any questions. Mm -hmm. I also have some folks as well. Okay, we have an amendment that came out of subcommittee, and so with the out objection here, it's amendment. Do you, do you have drafting code six three zero three? Is that correct? Um, whose amendment is that? Is that okay? Six three zero three. Is that your amendment? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Six three zero three. All right. All right. Let's uh, without objection. Let's go ahead and and um, put that on motion. Motion second on the amendment. Okay. All those in favor of Amendment 6303, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Okay. Uh, we have some folks here that do want to testify, and then there is another um, amendment uh, that uh, uh, we can potentially discuss later. But uh, if there's no objection, let's go out of session. Uh, we have a uh, Beth Goodner. And uh, for the record, uh, tell us your name, uh, who you're with, and make sure your mic is on there. Is it on? Yes. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Beth Goodner, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer for Trust Point Hospital in Murfreesboro. And we are a 217-bed facility uh, that services both physical rehab medicine and behavioral health care on an inpatient and outpatient basis. I want to say thank you to the sponsor and to the committee for taking up this important issue and for connecting patients to the appropriate care. There are just a few consideration points that I would like to point out from my vantage point as an operator and a clinician that I think are important. You know, we we have plenty of beds open. I don't, you know, the, the open beds are not the issue. The, the issue that we have are staffing those beds both from a nursing perspective and a patient care tech perspective. Uh, so that would be one consideration. And it's not just any bed, but it's the correct type of bed, whether that be a thought disorder versus an affective disorder bed uh, or child and adolescent versus senior bed, that type of thing. And from the operability of the hospital, I want to give last week as an example so we, we dealt with quite a bit of pretty intense acuity last week, and part of that was having several patients that were very self-injurious, and it required one-to-one -one staffing. We had four patients at one time that required that. So what that means is we had to, to put one patient care tech on each one of those patients for observation. If that had not been the case, that patient care tech would have been able to up uh, be working with 10 patients. So it the acuity of the patient load impacts staffing as well. 
We've got several portals uh, across the state and across different uh, age brackets that referrals come through. And this will be an additional portal. And between that and the, the various acuity on our units and within the facility, you know, entering what our bed availability is one time a day is just not going to be effective. So the other component that I would raise is just when we bring patients from significantly far away from their home, uh, the impact of involving the family in treatment and the proximity to the hospital impacts the care. No, thank you. Um, I think um, Chairman Hawk had a question for you. If any other members? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. And, ma'am, thank you very much for being here. I, it sounds like you may have some concerns with the bill as it's written or as it's amended now. Tell me what are the other portals that you have? And what, let's start with that. Tell me the other portals that you have to share information on, on one potential. Is, one is particular to child and adolescent services. So, uh, for instance, in Middle Tennessee, we utilize Youth Villages, and Youth, Vill Youth Villages utilizes a system called Xferral. So that's one example. Okay. If I could, Chairman, I'm going to follow up. What... We've been working with a sponsor a long time on this piece of legislation through, mm -hmm. through subcommittee and, and other works, and, and there may be an amendment come in a few minutes that says, all right, let's try this for a year. Let's, sure. let's see what this looks like and then get some type of a report to see if there is value. Do you operate or does your parent company operate in other states? Are they, do they have experience or do you have experience with how this similar legislation may have operated in other states, ma'am? I don't have experience with that. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chairman. Mm -hmm. All right. Representative Hemmer, you recognize? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, could you tell me today how you get referrals from hospitals or other referral sources? Various ways. So one of the main ways is through the crisis response teams that are located within the mental health centers. That's the biggest source. Uh, we can also receive referrals directly from emergency departments, doctor's offices. We can have direct walk-ins of people just directly to the hospital. Yep. Good. Um, and is your electronic health record you're using today, are you uploading that data to some type of uh, uh, you know, health information exchange, regional or statewide, that would be providing the data that is being sought in this this bill. Not at present. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Chairman Farmer. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and, and committee. And I and I apologize. I, I don't sit. I didn't sit on the subcommittee. This came through. So I just was curious. And, and thank you for being here. With regards to the from an operational perspective, boots mm -hmm. on the ground. Does this bill have? Does it help? help there or hurt or does it provide any direction that would be helpful? I mean, how I'm trying to understand how this would work just from. I think the, the broad premise of attempting to connect patients to the care they need is we can all agree upon that. I think what we would like, what I would suggest just to, in consideration is to take a step back and let's make sure that all the stakeholders are on the same page with what unintended consequences might be and how we can make it as efficient as possible. You recognize, and if you if you can, could you let us notice what does this look like if if we pass this piece of legislation? What what does it cause your facilities to do or not be able to do? And you might you may have said that a little bit in the, in the beginning of your your testimony, but I'm just kind of curious if you kind of walk through that. One of the concerns I have is the uploading of bed availability one time a day. Uh, that does not accurately reflect what your facility is going through. So last week, for instance, we were having throughput meetings three times a day to evaluate the acuity on our units, what our staffing was, what the one-to-one -one needs are. And, and that scenario plays out several times a week. So taking that into consideration and inputting data one time a day would not, I don't think it would be effective, particularly if everybody's doing that at various points of the day. Okay. You recognize? Hey, one more. So it sounds to me like it's extra work for folks that could be helping patients by doing this once a day. So what, what's the substantive effect 
to the patients? Is it, it sounds like it's, is it just duplicative of what's happening? Is it, is it going to show real-time data? I mean, what data? I mean, what's, what's I don't on? know that it would show real-time data because sure. for us as a facility, our dynamics are very fluid. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Committee. Thank you. Any further questions? Uh, Chairman Vaughn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So what you're, I'm a, I'm a simple dude, but I was pre-med for a semester, so I kind of understand what we're talking about. <laughs> you're, so basically you're saying that although a bed may be logged in as a bed, not every bed is the same mm -hmm. and has the same staffing associated with it. So while it may look like a data point, it doesn't tell the whole story. Is, right. is that what? Mm -hmm. That's accurate. I must have listened more in class than I thought. Thank you. Okay. All right. Any further questions for this uh, witness? Okay. See none. Thank you okay. for uh, your testimony. And uh, there were some other folks that might be available. Yeah. That I think I'm Elliot Pinsley. Uh, Pinsley. I'm Miss Susan uh, Blackwood's going to testify. Did they want to come up together or separate? Uh, whatever y'all, whatever you want, Chairman. Yeah. Come up together. That'd together be fine. Yeah. And again, for the records, uh, who you are, who you're with, and you have three minutes. My name is Suzanne Blackwood. I am a licensed professional counselor, mental health service provider. I practice at the Hope Center of Cannon County, and I am clinical director for the Family Counseling Center of Middle Tennessee. I also co-chair the Emergency Department's Committee for the Tennessee Diversion Coalition. HB 827 aims to help alleviate a broader problem, as Representative Sparks mentioned, known as emergency room boarding or emergency <coughs> department boarding. For years, the emergency room has been the default choice of care for persons experiencing mental health crises. As a clinician, I have often sent clients to the emergency room before when they were in crisis. Over the last few years though, I've begun hearing stories from clients about having to spend days in the emergency room. I've heard from colleagues who've told me about stories about their clients spending as much as two weeks in the emergency room. So when I had a client who became suicidal and went to the emergency room, I decided to go there myself and check things out. She ended up being held in the emergency room for nearly a week under a certificate of need. And the quality of care that she received there was disturbing. Hospital emergency departments are often not well equipped to handle mental health crises. The reason my client was there for so long was because she was waiting for a bed at a psychiatric hospital. I was shocked when I found out that a lot of hospital emergency departments have to get on the phone and call around to psychiatric hospitals to find out what beds are available. This is inefficient. It leads to longer emergency room stays and it delays the care that patients need. And this is unacceptable. I believe we can do better than this. What would have helped in my client's situation would have been a well-used, up-to-date psychiatric bed registry or bed tracking system that would inform emergency departments of when and where beds are available at psychiatric hospitals. Originally, we wanted this to be updated twice per day. The lady who testified before me mentioned that it doesn't accurately reflect current staffing levels. The reason we initially wanted it to be twice per day, once per 12 hour shift, was so that it could reflect current staffing levels because we realized that can change from shift to shift. So I ask that you recommend passage of this bill so that others do not have to experience what my client experienced. Lives are being affected daily by this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pinsley. Thank you, Chairman. Sorry, thank you, 
Thank you, Chairman and Committee. My name is Elliot Pinsley. I'm the CEO of the Behavioral Health Foundation, a nonprofit policy research center in Nashville. Uh, I also co-chair the Tennessee Diversion Coalition, of which Suzanne is a, a co-chair of one of our committees, as you'll hear in a second. Uh, since 2016, that Diversion Coalition has focused on identifying solutions to help people with mental health issues access care without needing to get wrapped up into the criminal justice system. The coalition includes nearly 100 leaders uh, from across the state, spanning law enforcement agencies, healthcare providers, mental health advocacy organizations, faith-based groups, family members, and others who work collaboratively to develop evidence-based policy recommendations for how we can effectively and efficiently help individuals in mental health crisis. This legislation, as was amended in Health Subcommittee, emerged as an urgent policy recommendation from the Emergency Departments and EMS Committee of the Tennessee Diversion Coalition. This, coalition, this committee was created after concerns were elevated by Suzanne and others across uh, many of our members regarding experiences of individuals who waited for extended periods of time, uh, days, sometimes weeks, for a psychiatric hospital bed to open up. That committee spent a great deal of time researching potential emergency department boarding solutions and engaging the state's leading experts in this topic. In 2018, the Department of Health and Department of Mental Health worked collaboratively to add the psychiatric bed tracking capabilities to the state's existing healthcare resource tracking system, known as HERTS, which since 2006 has been a key part of Tennessee's emergency preparedness plan. In the event of a natural or human-created disaster, the HERT system shows first responders what hospitals have available beds that can receive and treat patients needing immediate treatment. If a psychiatric hospital unit in Tennessee were to close suddenly due to a tornado, for example, having access to up-to-date data and hurt showing all the open beds at other psych hospitals would be essential to facilitating rapid patient transfers and avoiding overcrowding of nearby emergency rooms. In 2019, the Department of Mental Health received a SAMHSA grant and worked in collaboration with the Department of Health and hospital systems to improve the reliability of data in Hertz. This grant also allowed for the state to add a new patient bed matching tool to the Hertz system, which since November 2022 has definitively aided in over 1,076 patients successfully placed in psychiatric hospitals. The patient bed matching system is embedded and accessed within Hertz and pairs facility search results with bed availability data in the Hertz system. It was confirmed since subcommittee that there is only one place hospitals are being asked to update bed availability data, and that is within Hertz. There is no duplication of effort. And I actually have spoken personally with that uh, for-profit um, company, TransferAll, um, that did approach the state in previous years about doing this, and that, that did not go forward. Um, and they are a for-profit pay-to-play referral service that no, no one in state government is asking for any hospitals to use. That is fully optional and at their disposal. Youth Villages has just so happened to get involved because it is free for them, but receiving hospitals are required to pay a hefty fee. Uh, the individuals involved in developing these systems I discussed before reported it takes 15 minutes for a new facility uh, profile to be, at, to be added, yeah, and only two minutes to complete a daily update on the number of available beds. 2022, the T Tennessee Hospital Association, along with those two state departments, jointly sent a letter to hospitals <laughs> asking them and strongly encouraging use of both Hertz and the patient bed matching system to quickly identify availability and reduce, reduce time finding Ms. psychiatric Pinsley. hospital beds. Ms. Pinsley, your time's up. Uh, do we have any questions for the witnesses? Uh, Representative Farmer, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair, committee, and appreciate you all being here. Just trying to wrap my mind around this. So how is this going to help a situation in hospitals when the beds are so, it's so fluid throughout the day? How is one person entering this information once a day or multiple people once a day? How is this going to help? I'm just curious. I'm trying to wrap my mind around it. I mean, how is this going to help that situation? And I know our <laughs> ER is backed up. You, you spent time on that, but um, they've gotten much better, much, much better over the years as, as I've seen it. But, uh, but I'm just I'm just curious, how, how's this how's this going to help when it's so fluid to begin with? You're, you're recognized. If you look at the language. Sorry. If you look at the language, it breaks it down adult beds, geriatric beds, and adolescent beds. So we're already knowing specifically which types of beds are available. You can go online, anyone can, there's public access to the mental health portal, which is already in existence, and you can see which beds are available. But this information is only reliable if psychiatric hospitals are currently updating the mental health portal. 
you can see that some hospitals have not updated it since 2020. Well, that's useless information to emergency departments who are trying to place someone. Now, some psychiatric hospitals do diligently update it. You can see uh, they updated it today. You'll find some that have done that. But others are just not paying attention to this or they're not utilizing the technology that's there that can help this situation. If I can also add to that, um, she's correct. And But additionally, this is a minimum standard. We, As Suzanne correctly stated, um, it was the Tennessee Hospital Association that requested we amend this legislation before subcommittee to bring it to um, one time a day minimum standard for reporting. We started by looking at what was done nationally, and the most common metric was minimum two times a day. Some work on real time, which I've been informed the Department of Mental Health has been working on with the regional mental health institutes, but that's only four out of the 30 psychiatric hospitals that operate in the state of Tennessee. So hospitals, if they see that there's a need to update their bed availability more often than once a day, there's nothing in this legislation that would prohibit them from doing so. In fact, that would certainly be encouraged. And, uh, and again, I'm sure if they'd like to work toward a real-time solution that folks would be willing to listen to them. Okay. Uh, Chairman Jernigan. Thank you. My question, I guess, is more about the staff issue. I'm trying to wrap it why would you report that a bed is available if you don't have the staff? It seems to me if that it wasn't staffed, you would just say it's not available. So, I, and, and maybe this is for the, the previous witness, but it doesn't make any sense to me that you would put a bed up there that you didn't have staff for. Is that, is that, you're, you're right, do I have that right? Okay. Well, what, one of our hopes was if there there is the ability, if there are truly, we're only asking for staffed available beds to be reported. That meets a definition that's common that hospitals have agreed to in other contexts that is being clear. So this is accounting for that. So we're only asking for them to note how many beds can you active, actually take a patient for if someone were referred right now. And we do understand, as was mentioned, that is fluid, that that can change throughout the day. And that certainly can be updated but absolutely um that's a very good question okay that, uh, okay that that makes that makes sense to me because it takes that i don't know why you if you don't have the staff on it then don't put the bed on so okay thank you thank you chairman vaughn and i apologize i was involved in a high level sidebar conversation with our bill sponsor over there when you introduced yourself could you uh tell me what organization you're with again uh, yeah. Elliot, I'm Elliot Pinsley. I'm the CEO of the Behavioral Health Foundation. I also co-chair the Tennessee Diversion Coalition. Okay. It, are you a registered lobbyist? No, sir. Represent, you're not. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, when we go back with our sponsor, I'll, I'll ease out right now, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Thank you. All right. Any further questions while we're out of session? Okay. See, uh, seeing none, uh, uh, thank you for your testimony. Okay. Without objection, we'll go back into session. Uh, General Sparks, you recognize? Yeah. yeah, I've got, last uh, week we had testimony, well, I read testimony from a patient. Um, if I can read it again, Chairman, the lady couldn't, she wasn't able to take off work today, but if I could read it, Chairman, um, she, she says, my name is Helen. I'm a certified nursing assistant for 29 years. Now in Coffee County, I've dealt with mental illness since age of 15. I'm writing on behalf of HB 827 with the amendment to create a psychiatric bed registry. I was held in an emergency room during my mental health crisis. I was held in my local uh, ER for 72 hours, at which time I was denied regular medication, clean clothes, or regular meals. I was denied the right to personal hygiene or visitors. I was being held until a psychiatric unit bed became available. I was number 35 on the waiting list. For me, this did nothing to help my situation, but only escalated my crisis. My anxiety was at an all-time high. For someone in a mental health crisis, the situation, lack of compassion and care from staff had a terrible effect. People may be scared to reach out for help, which in turn, the crisis only gets worse. Afterwards, I was referred to the room where I was held, what she called the torture chamber. I was alone, I was cold, I was hungry, and I was scared. Thank God, my, my therapist, whom re I reached out to during my ED boarding, she stepped in as my advocate, was able to find a facility that had a bed opening. Um, I'm terribly trauma traumatized, but she's in recovery. Unfortunately, others may not have the power to recover. Today, I'm able to tell my story and hopefully make changes to help others. Please pass 827, she goes on to say. 
All right, um, Timber Vaughn, did you have a question right now? One thing, I want to take a little pride of authorship, Mr. Chairman. This committee passed uh, a bill to assist with getting people placed uh, when we redid the rules over who could refer people to psych hospitals. I don't know whether or not that's had time. To, well, I know it hasn't had time to take effect, but I don't know if it will alleviate or at least help this situation to some degree because we do need to get folks when they're having some of the worst days of their lives into proper treatment and care. But I did want to say that that I know that we've looked at this issue before uh, and basically I'm bragging on a bill that I carried that we've already okay. approved. So thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you. Um, all right. Um, we have another amendment before us from a committee member. Uh, Amendment 7171, Chairman Kumar, uh, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Move to withdraw. Okay, uh, we ha we are withdrawing Amendment 7171 without objection. Okay, any further questions for the sponsor? Uh, I, I do have some comments and, and questions um, for you. And th my understanding is this, this will not take effect until... 2025 is that yes, correct we've we worked with thi on that okay and um there are obviously se several stakeholders in the amendment that was drawn with something as far as uh potentially making this more of a pilot program uh but obviously that was withdrawn but there are a lot of people that were interested in having this discussion and uh i, I want to i guess my question to you is since this if this passes and it's not in effect until 2025. And there, there is a bigger issue out here than than what we're dealing with right here in the number of beds. Yes, sir. And that is getting individuals uh, seen and into the proper proper beds. We have a mobile crisis health unit, and I think uh, they've done like 70,000 of those. And I think it's 28,000 get a first certificate of need, and of those, maybe 60% need a bed. And so they're looking for beds. We have ERs looking for beds. Uh, we have other, you know, doctor's offices. We have, we have multiple places looking for beds. And it seems like there are several systems out there, and this is just one of them. And being that we have a, uh, a mental health crisis uh, in the United States, yes. in the state, serious discussions have to be made as to whether or not this is a system that the, the state has, but whether or not we need to have somebody manning that system and as a switchboard, or how do we coordinate all these? And that may be something that I guess point being is if this passes, there needs to, I need a commitment from you that if we're going to have these types of discussions that we will have time to come back. And, you know, if this passes, you know, and it becomes law, that we maybe have to amend this yes, or do something different that will yes, override this. And I just want to make sure that you have that commitment. Oh, yes. Uh, it, we, we need the discussion. I mean, what, what I said in subcommittee last week, what we seen um, at the Covenant School was a mental health crisis. We all know it. Everyone in this room knows it. Um, sadly, the media doesn't seem to address the mental health component. They're not here covering this bill. It doesn't fit their, their political narrative. But Chairman, I'm open to that. I think everyone on this committee is open to it. I think all the parties here, I know THAs uh, uh, will will commit to, to more discussion, but I wanted to remind the committee, the supporting groups, Tennessee Sheriff's Association, Tennessee Diversion Coalition, National Alliance on Mental Health Illness, Tennessee College of Emergency Physicians um, are all in support of this. Also, as far as the uh, time, uh, going back to Chairman Farmer's question, on updating this, literally, someone told me it's two minutes, two minutes, and this is real time. I mean, could you imagine being on the phone trying to get a bed placement? Nobody does that. This is real time. This is a good bill. We've got a lot of support. Um, I could quote some of the states, Chairman, Alabama, Alaska, Connecticut, Florida, Georgia, Idaho, Indiana, Iowa, Kansas, Maryland, Massachusetts, Minnesota, Mississippi, Missouri. Nevada, New Jersey, New York, North Carolina, Ohio, Oklahoma, Rhode Island, Utah, Vermont, uh, Virginia, West Virginia, and Wisconsin. And I hope with your help, we'll add Tennessee to this list to help improve this mental health crisis that we've got going on. Chairman Farmer, you recognize me? Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and a couple things have been said that's really perked my ears is, well, if we pass this and it needs to be fixed, we can come back and fix it. I think if we're going to pass a piece of legislation, it needs to be done right. 
the first time because we don't need to be coming back potentially fixing a piece of legislation. So with that said, this doesn't take effect until 2025. I'm going to make a motion. We roll this to, to the first calendar of 2024. I have a second for that. That's a proper motion. Um, all right, without objection, we will be voting to roll this the first calendar of 2024. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Ayes have it. Bill will be rolled to the first calendar of 2024. That brings us to item number six. You have a motion, a second, House Bill 738. You are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. I think there is an, amendment. an amendment. 6150, is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. With uh, That came out of sub, so without objection, let's uh, vote on Amendment 6150. You have a motion, a second. You have a motion, a second on Amendment 6150. So all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. We are back on the bills amended. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, committee members. This amendment rewrites the bill to create a doula advisory committee for the purpose of recommending a set of core competencies for practicing doulas and recommending reimbursement rates and fee schedules for 10 care reimbursement. All right. Do we have any questions for the sponsor of the bill? Seeing none, we will be voting on House Bill 738 as amended. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Bill goes on to finance, ways, and means. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Thank you. That brings us to item number seven, House Bill 1317. Chairman Kumar, you are recognized. You have a motion a second. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And we have an amendment, I believe. Yes, that is 6749. So you have a motion second on Amendment 6749, and that uh, rewrites the bill. If there's no objection, let's go ahead and get that on the bill. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Uh, we are back on the bills a minute. You're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. House Bill 1317 amends the Pharmacy Practice Act in Title 63 to strengthen and streamline the functions of the Pharmacy Board improve representation by increasing the number of members from seven to nine. Uh, this adds uh, a pharmacy technician for the first time, as well as an other practicing pharmacist to the board. Qualifications of members are also improved and it specifies the duties of the executive director along with allowing advisory rulings uh, and licensing of pharmacy interns. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is uh, certainly will be an improvement in the current functions of the pharmacy board. Right, thank you. Do we have any uh, questions for the sponsor of the bill? Okay. Seeing none, we'll be voting on House Bill 1317 as amended. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Bill goes on to government operations. Thank you. And that brings us to item number eight, House Bill 271. Uh, Rooms of Hicks. You are recognized. Thank you, you Mr. Motion, Chairman. Second. I have amendment 6330 that makes a bill. Motion. Second. Let's see here. Okay, yes. Uh, okay, so without objection, uh, you have motion a second on amendment 6330. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. We're back on the bills amended. And did you have a I have a second, second amendment. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I have a second amendment that's uh, 7218. Motion, okay. Second. You have a motion second on 7218. And can you, before we put that on, it makes a small change. Can you uh, tell us what that does? Uh, it makes a small change and just says that you have to be a legal U.S. resident. All right. Yep. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, without objection, let's vote on amendment 7218. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. We're back on the bills amended. You are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This bill creates a new certification for psychological testing technicians. 
to be housed under the Board of Examiners in Psychology. It does not create a new board or a committee of an existing board. Technicians will be certified to administer and score uh, standardized psychological and neuropsychological tests and to be observed uh, and described uh, a client's test behaviors and responses. They must have a bachelor's or master's degree in psychology with a minimum of 72 hours of total education and training related to psychological and neuropsychological test administration and scoring. <laughs> Technicians are not allowed to select the test or to be, to be administered, interpret the test or write the test or give the test feedback to clients. Technicians must be supervised by a psychologist or senior psychological examiner. And there's uh, about 30 states with such a certification as this. So that's the bill. With that, I'll renew my motion, Mr. Chairman. All right. Any questions for the sponsor of the bill? All right. Seeing none, we are voting to send House Bill 271 to government operations. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Bill goes on to government ops. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, committee. Oh, thank you. And that brings us to item number nine, House Bill 566. Chair Lady Carringer, you are recognized. You have a motion and a second. And is there an amendment here? Yes. yes. Amendment 5757, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Uh, without objection, uh, let's vote on Amendment 5757. All those in favor say aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. We're back on the bills amended. You are recognized. Okay. Thank you, Chairman and Committee. Uh, what the Amendment 5757 does is that it removes uh, the law enforcement and investigative information on this bill. And um, what this bill does is to create the Overdose Fatality Review Act, which would authorize a county to establish a multidisciplinary and multi agency overdose fatality review local team, and two or more counties to jointly establish a single multi county team. Provides overdose fatality review teams with duties and responsibilities to examine and understand the circumstances leading up to a fatal overdose so that policy recommendations and resource allocations can prevent further future overdoses. And uh, so it would be similar to a child fatality review that has existed in Tennessee for many years and has brought forth recommendations like the safe sleep or co-sleeping recommendations. Uh, the ones that would be brought to the table on this would be public health, social, social services, medical examiner, court system, DA's office, corrections, substance misuse treatment providers, law enforcement, health care providers, and many more depending on the community. I serve and have served on the Metro Drug Coalition Board in, in Knox County for many years, and we have essentially been the pilot program for uh, the Overdose Fatality Review, Review Board for the past two years. The team has uh, been able to identify and Vention points where many lives could have been saved, especially hospital emergency departments and detention facilities. Hospital partners are collaborating to sustain and improve peer navigator programs in the ED to get patients into addiction treatment programs straight from the hospital. Several other counties either have the overdose fertility review or are attempting to start one. So with that, um, I will stand for any questions. Do we have any questions for the sponsor of the bill? All right, seeing none, we are voting on House Bill 566 as amended. All those in favor say aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Bill goes on to government operations. Thank you, Chair. All right, thank you. And that brings us to item number 10, and I will be passing the gavel to our Vice Chair Leatherwood. Thank you, Chairman Terry. You are recognized on item number 10, House Bill 273. A motion and a second. I believe there's an amendment you have for the bill. Yes, uh, 6763. Sounds good. That's what we've got. And to put it in the shape it needs to be in, uh, we'll go ahead and vote on the amendment. We've got a motion and a second. All those in favor of Amendment 6763 indicate by saying aye. All those opposed, ayes have it. Uh, we are now properly on the bill 
as amended and Chairman Terry, you're recognized. Thank you, uh, Chairman and committee. This, uh, what this bill does, it's been worked out with the Department of Health and it allow the Board of Medical Examiners to confirm the authorization and to revoke the authorization for the medical consultant to uh, work with them. Uh, with that description, do we have any questions of the sponsor? Seeing none, we will go ahead and vote on House Bill 273. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? <laughs> the ayes have it and we'll be moving on to calendar and rules. As amended. Thank you. And before we adjourn here, uh, this ho will hopefully be our last uh, last meeting. I do want to thank the members of the committee for the work that um, everybody has put in. We've had some um, we've done some fine work this year, and we've had some pretty big issues that have come through this committee. Uh, thank you for your dedication. Uh, thank you for uh, flexibility and uh, creating fair le legislation that betters the lives of Tennesseans. I'd like to thank our committee staff, uh, Mike Critchfield. Uh, our attorneys, Caroline Miller and Matt King, uh, and, uh, uh, my assistant Megan Dix, and then our clerks, Mason Hiskey and Ailish Sweeney, and also our interns, Julian Sons and Cindy Solis. And it's been, uh, my honor to, uh, serve along everybody, uh, on this committee. And let's see what else, uh, and Tony Townsend. Our, our sergeant arms there appreciate his work for uh for keeping us in line and and uh making sure that we run an efficient committee so uh, uh chairman hawk you're right thank you mr chairman and and to someone who has been working on these issues for a while but newer to this committee and, and myself i want to say thank you for the diligence and the expertise that you have brought to this committee you have been a tremendous leader with the gavel in hand who has allowed a very vigorous debate and I appreciate that and I think we've come up with some substantially good products throughout this process in in the, in the legislature so uh, chairman Terry kudos to you let's give you a round of applause thank you Representative Mitch, you recognize? yeah and as a member of the minority party I, I I also applaud you for allowing fair debate in this committee I uh, appreciate that. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. So thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. That's hard to do. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, so if they're seeing no further business before us, uh, we are going to be adjourned to the call of the chair. Thank you.